Michael, in the year 2000, you had a near-death experience on the occasion of a serious motorbike accident. How did you go through this? Well, it was on May 12th of that year. And at the time, I was working for the company Roche in Switzerland, and I was on the way home. I had to work in three shifts, and at the time, I was on the early shift. Shortly before 2 p.m., I was on my motorbike going home. But about two or three miles before reaching my home, there was a garbage truck in front of me. I assumed that there could only be one space where I could overtake the garbage truck, and that is what I finally intended to do. Then I tried to look to the right of the garbage truck, and realizing that I had a clear road ahead, I also checked the left side of the road, and there also I had clearance. So I started to pass the truck. But before I could get back to the right lane, before completely passing the garbage truck, I suddenly was confronted by an oncoming car, which I had not seen before, and this because of the blind spot. And due to the acceleration of my motorbike to about 60 miles an hour, and due to the fact that the car approaching me at a speed of, of 50 miles an hour from this long, drawn-out curve, I crashed head-on with this car. This happened within fractions of a second. One couldn't react any faster. Before that, I still tried to brake, but in vain. The impact was so violent that I was catapulted by the force about 20 yards into the air. Shortly before, my right hand was separated by the braking, and my pelvis got caught in the motorbike handlebar, and I was catapulted forward. Therefore, my pelvic bones were smashed, and then I collided against the windscreen of this car. And then, as if from a ski jump, I was catapulted by the force 20 yards into the air, like this. I fell down on the street, which means that my thorax and face were looking upwards. I wore a full face helmet. Due to the impact, my right coronary artery inside my pelvis was severed. But at first one couldn't see this because it was inside my pelvis. Well, I was lying there on the street, but first I passed out. Then the driver of the garbage truck put his hand on my shoulder, saying that I should keep calm and breathe regularly, and that help would arrive immediately. Well, I recognized a voice, and at that time I had learned a breathing technique in Munich, which I recollected at this moment. So I initiated this breathing technique because in doing so, I could shut down the beating of my heart and all the other symptoms. So I was lying on the street for about 15 to 20 minutes. Meanwhile, the emergency doctor arrived. He was also my family doctor. The rescue helicopter from Zurich arrived after about 20 minutes, and the doctor informed me that I would have serious internal injuries. And the idea was that I should immediately be intubated. But the emergency doctor on board the helicopter didn't want to lose any time and wanted to start out immediately. Consequently, he put me into the helicopter, and at the moment the helicopter rose, I felt much lighter lighter and lighter, but I no longer had the strength to maintain this breathing rhythm, and so I was ready to die. I had given up everything. This was a very emotional moment which I was experiencing, this readiness to die. Then the helicopter continued on its way, and about halfway to the University Hospital in Freiburg in the Black Forest, they realized that I had died. Therefore, they immediately initiated an emergency landing. They landed in an open area in order to resuscitate me with electric shocks and so on, and I watched everything from outside my body. When the helicopter was still in flight, I found myself on the side of the helicopter. I was particularly aware of the noise. I saw the black forest below me, the streets, the cars, which usually are driving there, and this was a wonderful moment. It was such a lightness 
comparable with bird floating. How did you see the helicopter when you were outside of it? The helicopter was beside me. I heard the loud noise of the rotors, and later on I saw myself lying in the helicopter, and then I saw how the doctor for medical care on board bent down over me. After that, they initiated the emergency landing, and then I experienced some sort of film cut. After having finished the reanimation, they continued to fly to Freiburg, to the university hospital, and then on arrival, during landing on the clinic building of the hospital, and before the helicopter touched down on the roof of the building, I experienced a second exit. In principle, I died for the second time because of heart failure. Well, then physicians and helpers came out of the lift in order to take my body out of the helicopter. You have said that you experienced an exit. Had you been outside your body and could you see your body from there? Yes, I saw myself and this was quite interesting for me because there was no relationship between me and my body, although I recognized it, but I am finally here, even though without my body. It was very interesting what I realized again and again afterwards regarding this being outside. So I also was able to describe the way from the landing deck into the lift and down to the accident surgery. Although I had never seen it before and had never been up there, and then I immediately had to undergo an operation. There was the same procedure as before, fairly long-lasting electric shocks. Then obviously they tried to reanimate me, and the vantage point there in the operating theater was from above, at an angle from above, from where I could see everything they were doing to me. What was the distance from which you saw all of this? In feet? Yes. Well, well, it felt like about 10 feet at maximum, therefore very close, and I could see everything from above. So I also could perceive thought processes and other things of the physicians which they did not express. I had the good fortune that they talked with me later on, telling me that I couldn't possibly have known all this, because all this was only in their thoughts. Well, I realized in this way what is possible if you are free in spirit. But they continued to resuscitate me. However, I gradually became almost aggressive, because meanwhile I perceived the light beside me. Subtly, and on the other hand, these efforts by the physicians to resuscitate me, and so I turned up my aggression. Finally, I shouted, leave me alone, leave me alone, I want to go there, I want to go there. But of course, they couldn't hear me in that condition. You have said that you perceived the light. In which way did you see or feel the light? First, the light was a bit far away, at my right side, and I saw it, but my concentration was again there on my body. But nevertheless, I tried somehow to stop them from resuscitating me, because I wanted them to let me go, and because I felt a kind of magnetic pull, and I was attracted by this like a magnet. The only thing I desired was to go there. It was a feeling like coming home. I just wanted to go home. I felt this love. Well, this was very difficult for me, and they simply did not stop reanimation. And then at some point I felt some sort of resignation, whereby I had the impression of living between two worlds. They didn't let me go, although I would have liked to do so. But it was very difficult when I consider all of this. And often I asked someone in the hospital to let me go. Then the situation occurred where I had given up. I turned again toward the light and suddenly it was all over with my body down there. I found myself inside something like a vast and bright space without rough edges, nothing of the same. There was nothing but brightness. 
It was white, brilliantly white. It makes you feel as though you would look directly at the sun, but without pain. This is how you could describe this feeling. Well, I was lying there in this space, if you could call it that, but this was not a vast space, it was just white. Well, I was lying there, and suddenly I saw some beings taking shape and approaching me. They came directly toward me, lining up around me. This was incredible. They were beings, and I had the impression of knowing them. Very familiar faces, but somehow not from this life on Earth. They had facial characteristics of indigenous origin long hair and feathers tucked into their hair, but totally white clothes, comparable to those of the old Egyptians. And in this manner, they were standing around me. One of them stepped out from the group approaching me, putting his hand on my heart and saying to me, my brother, your time has not yet come. He also said, that I would still have many tasks, important tasks, but he didn't say any more. I could somehow accept it. Then I noticed how he turned to the other Indian beings, asking them to touch and treat me all over my body, but very carefully, because I would have ancient knowledge inside me. That sounds crazy now, but I understood him and I could accept it, so this was all right. Then they touched me all over my body as if they would massage and embalm me. I have this smell in my nose still today. Sometimes when I lie down in the afternoon, or I sense this odor again very strongly, sometimes at night in my dreams. At one moment when they were around me and treating me, I asked them every now and then if other people would be there where I am now. And I heard one of them saying that two other people who were to be treated would presently be here. Furthermore, they argued imploringly that I still would have some tasks to do here. However, I felt a strong longing to accompany them. Then they said goodbye, and this was really bad for me. When I awoke from the coma, I had a lot of pain, so that for days and weeks I was praying every night that they might come back in order to take me away. Well, this was hard, a hard time for me. It was in the first year, in May, when this accident happened. Therefore, I was in the hospital for the whole year. I had to relearn everything, for example, how to walk. I had a body weight of only 97 pounds and a height of almost six feet. I had no muscles, and I had to relearn everything from the beginning. I often was thinking about committing suicide, but I was not able to do it. But this desire to move again into this light was very strong. What consequences did this near-death experience have on your future life? First, I realized very quickly that there is a reason why this happened to me. Because of the many operations I had to have, I was in the hospital for a total of more or less two years. And these two years were time enough for me to reflect upon myself, and I found that this experience had shown me something, namely, to deal with my life carefully. I have realized somehow that from my childhood onwards, throughout my life, I always was accompanied by a longing for death. But I was not aware of this consciously. It only became apparent for me in this context, and so I practically swore I'd always bear in mind to do all I could to take care of myself. After the accident, when I was reasonably fit and mobile, I went to the place where the accident had happened every year on May 12th, the time of the accident. And I always used to sit down there on the grass, praying to the universe and promising to take care of myself. 
and not to be either at the mercy of some people I know, nor of any other people. This was the meaning of my life, the main focus of my life. Ever since I was a child, I had tried to do everything in order to be loved, to do, to do everything for others, without thinking about my own needs. So I swore I'd never again forget about myself, and in doing so, I experienced an inner calm. So I personally have become very strong without becoming egocentric, but I very clearly realized where my limits were without offending anyone. But I can say now, stop. This is too much for me now. This is what I have learned through this experience. Michael, thank you very much for this interview. I also thank you.